Would you go ahead? Thank you, Randall. Bill Dietzer is a hiker, speaker, historian, and his professional career near the end of that accumulated uh, with the Cincinnati State Community College. Uh, he's a native uh, Cincinnatian, uh, and uh, Smokies is one of his favorite uh, national parks to uh, visit. But uh, he has hiked in 50 of the 63 U.S. national parks. He's been to the bottom of the Grand Canyon and back seven times. He has uh, led hikes of many age groups. He has, uh, he and his wife, Rosemary, who's here today, Rosemary is uh, front and center, or front and side. Uh, she's accompanied him on many of those. And Rosemary is his um, um, editorial staff uh, for the production of his um, uh, uh, programs and uh, for the book that he has recently published. Uh, we have a uh, copy of the book available for your review. There'll be a book review of it later. And interestingly enough, it's available in both color and black and white. Sort of a rarity to see a book that's published in color. Now, now the black and white photographs are in black and white. But they're not in color. But uh, Bill has done a significant amount of research, and every time uh, he looks at the, uh, the information he has, and it's one of the problems about book production, and I think Randall's working on a book right now that he can uh, talk about that to where just when you think you're ready to go to, uh, to print, something new and interesting shows up. Uh, the, uh, and that's the way it is with Bill's programs. If you, uh, you're fortunate enough to see this one, but if you hold on uh, for this uh, winter, Wilderness Wildlife Week, we'll have, Bill will have a program uh, at that as well, and I'm sure you'll find some stuff in that that uh, is not gonna be presented today, and vice versa. I think today's program will have some stuff that you won't see at the Wilderness Wildlife Week. So good for you that you were able to uh, attend both of them. Uh, that's all I've got, and I won't waste any more of your time. Let's all give a, uh, a round of welcome to Bill Dietzer. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, a little bit of background. Uh, with my parents and grandparents, I've been visiting the Smokies since the 1940s. Uh, we, as was mentioned earlier, we're native Cincinnatians. Uh, I actually volunteer in the park and maintain a trail. Uh, it's uh, obviously a labor of love. What intrigued me about the Smokies back in the uh, 1940s was when we would come down for two or three days, uh, I would count 25 to 30 black bears. And you'd say, well, why? Why would you see so many black bears? Well, that was the open garbage can days, folks. Fortunately, the park system caught on that, hey, this is not a good idea. Out in Glacier National Park in 1963, a couple of folks died with grizzly bears out there. And so the park service caught on, whoops, uh, this is not a good play. We better, you know, <coughs> not get involved with that set of circumstances and let the animals uh, do their own thing. Ah, oh, there, we fucked up. Uh, so on that note, uh, you know, let's kind of jump off into this uh, neat little program. I'll start off with uh, 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 the concept. Originally, it was called the Emergency Conservation uh, Work. Uh, it was always a temporary program. It went from uh, 1933 through 1942. So every two years, uh, it had to, uh, to be uh, renewed. Uh, here is FDR upon accepting the uh, Democratic uh, nomination <coughs> excuse me, in 1932. Promise, I pledge you, I pledge myself to a new deal for the American people. After election, FDR requested for the quick creation of a civil conservation corps to be used for civil work, not interfering with normal employment and confining itself to forestry, prevention of soil erosion, flood control, and similar projects. 
Congress approved the request for the CCC on March the uh, 31st, 1933, and within three months. Can you imagine a government program within three months uh, getting uh, not only started, but having 250,000 uh, men employed? A little bit of background on uh, FDR, 32nd president, elected four times, uh, of course passed away in uh, office, uh, born 1882, uh, passed away in 1945, he had polio in 1921. They kind of really, you know, unlike today where everyone has to know everything, it was kind of kept a secret when he actually went to the dedication at New Fun Gap for the park. Uh, he basically drove himself. He had a specially equipped car so that he could do that. Uh, so, uh, and his background was, uh, he was actually the uh, governor of uh, New York from 1929 through 1932. And basically, he started the kind of program that this Civil Conservation Corps uh, became on a national basis. So uh, he had, uh, uh, some assistance, uh, a gal that worked for him uh, ended up uh, being a major player in his administration by the name of Francis Perkins. Uh, this is, uh, if you seek their monuments, look about you. This is out there in the uh, Cage Cove uh, area. That's where one of the uh, camps was. Uh, of course, got some wildlife uh, there. And uh, basically it built, as it says, roads, trails, bridges, buildings, campgrounds, and uh, picnic areas in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. A uh, very uh, important program for not only national parks, but state parks. And here's the uh, headquarters. Actually, the CCC put in the foundation. Contractors ended up uh, putting the rest of the, uh, the building together, but uh, they put in two visitor centers. They put in all the park roads. Uh, the tunnels, the fire towers, there were over 12 fire towers in this park uh, because of course, you know, lots of uh, over 500,000 acres of, uh, of land there, uh, put in over 800 miles of trails. I'm actually the first person living in Ohio to do all 800 miles of trails in the Smokies. Uh, so I know the trails pretty well and uh, that's one of the reasons why I volunteer to sort of pay back for the wonderful experiences I had. Uh, they put in the campgrounds, picnic areas, and of course, uh, fish hatcheries. So they did everything to make this a usable situation. Here's a picture of uh, the David C. Chapman camp in Greenbrier. You'll never see those two words separated normally, but in this case they were. David Chapman was actually the fellow that was responsible for the acquisition of the, the lands in the park. Not exactly the most popular fellow, once people got this place, to put it mildly, there were signs out in Cades Cove, don't come within 50 miles of us, David, because we're not happy with you. But I think with some of the uh, descendants that I've talked to that had you know, relatives that basically uh, you know, sold their land, they realized that if it hadn't became a national park, all we'd have is condos and everything else. Uh, we wouldn't have this wonderful place that we now have. So that, uh, there were actually 22 uh, CCC camps in the Smokies. Uh, here's uh, one of the, uh, uh, this is Ravensford, uh, the, the nursery uh, that, uh, because actually 60% uh, of the Smokies have been clear cut. 60% have been clear cut. Um, so it was important to you know, basically revegetate. Can you imagine with the weather that we have sometimes, the amount of rain on this mountainous terrain, what would happen if they hadn't, you know, uh, reforested basically the, uh, the area? Here's uh, the, uh, the process moving along a little better. Uh, here's uh, them at the uh, uh, fish hatchery. The next one's kind of an intriguing little shot too, how they transported them. This is how they got them out to the uh, several thousand miles of streams within the park. Uh, they always uh, put in native fish, but of course, you know, the whole ecosystem got fouled up with, you know, what was going on with the 18 lumber companies that basically, you know, clear cut the, uh, the, uh, the area. Well, 
describe this, this avocation. Uh, it's actually a foreman that they're referred to as LEMS, locally employed men, uh, showing the, uh, the folks uh, uh, the uh, technique to be used in the uh, stone cutting. And of course, yes, uh, they started with the big stuff and uh, then uh, the CCC guys ended up uh, having the job of uh, getting it down into usable form. And of course, all the road abutments are uh, set up with those uh, rock formations. The tunnels out there on the uh, New Fund Gap Road, there's two of them. And of course, this is the largest uh, bridge uh, ever built uh, in the CCC, the Altmont Bridge. Beautiful uh, setup uh, out there. This is the uh, Elkmont Bridge over uh, the Husky Branch uh, area out there. Elkmont's a really neat area to hike in, that, that uh, little river uh, area out there. And this is uh, out there on Laurel Creek Road. Uh, if you're coming in from Townsend, you make the right turn and you almost immediately uh, come upon this uh, Laurel Creek uh, Road Tunnel. This next one shows the uh, chestnut uh, tree removal. Uh, one of the things that CCC did not do was use fire. That, uh, in, in those days, was not considered to be good for a forest, which is just the opposite of what they realize today. So some of the concepts that they pursued uh, have changed, but they were using you know, the, the thought processes of the time. And here's a couple of the guys there at uh, Trillium Gap, uh, which is real close to the trailhead uh, that I uh, maintain, which is called Old Sugarlands, which starts just uh, away from the Sugarlands Visitor Center and goes up into Cherokee Orchard Road. Okay, why the need for the CCC? Uh, the Great Depression, 1929 stock market crash, uh, that's a good starting point. Uh, stocks had dropped to 20% of their uh, October uh, 1929 value. Unemployment was at 13.3 or 25% of the workforce. There was a timber famine, harvesting, tree diseases, insects, fire loss was greater than the new growth. So basically in those days, the uh, lumber companies had the idea of clear cutting and you know, we were the land of plenty. They weren't really worried. So you, it's easy to criticize them, but we were sort of spoiled that we could kind of do what we wanted to do. And so it's easy to rip into the 18 lumber companies and say, hey, why did they do what they did? Well, that was sort of the game in, in those days. Uh, recreational areas and roads were inadequate. So yeah, there were lots of needs. Uh, here's a little uh, picture of a man may, may be down, but he is never out. Uh, one of the uh, sayings was, can you spare a dime? Can you imagine anyone asking, can you spare a dime now? Jeez, what would that be for? Uh, families, of course, were starving. Uh, the Dust Bowl, uh, there were 20 black blizzards in 1935. They carried dust from the plains to Cleveland. There were two and a half uh, million Plains residences that uh, left for other areas, and Plains area was defined as Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Colorado. So major displacements, and of course, people without money. The worst of all possible things when you're forced to. Here's uh, our little uh, employment uh, uh, poster to uh, say, hey guys, we're, we're gonna I'm going to give you something that's going to help not only you, but help this wonderful country of ours. The CCC camps, uh, the number of camps from 33 through 42, the average was 1,643. And as I say, it was uh, renewed every two years. So there was a political process that they had to go through. There was a lot of criticism of FDR for uh, you know, how it was going to be administered, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But Highest number at any time was 2,912, but the lowest uh, number was uh, 399. Uh, the camp information as far as the breakdown, the Ag Agriculture Service had 71%, uh, which included the Soil Conservation Group, which was uh, basically for the farmers. Interior Department had 26 and a half. War Defense, two and a half, and the average number of camps per state was 30, and of course we only had 48 states, but there were, uh, you know, Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and uh, District of Columbia and Virgin Islands also had uh, activity. So it, uh, it was a nationwide approach, obviously. Uh, 
the breakout of the uh, number of, of uh, staff. They were usually referred to as juniors or enrollees. Uh, the theoretical age limit was 18 to 25, but back in those days, birth records weren't exactly exciting. So depending on you know the dynamics, sometimes some young people got in well below uh, 18. Uh, and so the uh, next group, African Americans, uh, of course, I didn't say there's almost 2,900,000 of the, uh, the white Caucasian, and it was all male, all male. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we get down to the veterans. Uh, the African Americans, there were 250,000. Uh, there were about 150 camps, uh, and most of the time they were not integrated camps. And we'll get into this concept that I'll next throw out there is it had to be locally accepted. So in other words, there were places where the African-Americans were not welcome, and the last thing in the world the, the, you know, the bureaucrats wanted to do was create you know, a problem because they had to have local acceptance because they were trying to help the local situation. So uh, many of these ended up in uh, national parks. Uh, as far as the African Americans uh, were concerned, but basically before they put an African American camp into a, an area, they basically checked with a local power structure to make sure that they would be accepted. Otherwise, they knew they were creating a problem that was not gonna, gonna work out very well. War veterans, uh, this is actually due to Eleanor. The uh, uh, first World War veterans had been uh, promised a uh, a bonus for their service and uh, it had been put off. It was originally uh, going to be paid in 1945. Well, the bet when this whole depression thing, you know, uh, came about and unraveled, you know, everybody's universe, uh, the veterans said, hey, you know, this is not fair. They ended up having a massive march on Washington. FDR and his infinite wisdom said, Eleanor, would you go meet with the, the uh, World War I vets and have a discussion with them and see if we can work out something. And basically she came back and said, include them in the CCC. And that was a win-win kind of deal. And uh, he then worked with Congress and the bonus ended up actually uh, being paid in uh, 1936. But it was a real wonderful thing that Eleanor pulled off. Next group, the Native Americans, uh, they didn't have the age descriptions. By the way, the juniors couldn't be married. Uh, the uh, Native Americans could be married, and they did all their work on the, uh, their own tribe. And so it worked through their tribal structure, basically. Uh, then last, well, the territorial, as I said, it was 50,000 that ended up there. The locally employed men, this was a really important thing. The reason it was important is, once again, to get acceptance uh, locally because uh, we got a lot of unemployed guys and then you're bringing in these camps with all outsiders and obviously that could create some major you know, problems. So the expertise to supervise was going to be sent to these locally employed men. They could be married, they were paid more, uh, $45 a month if they were the lead uh, guy. Uh, so that was once again an attempt to get you know, better acceptance of, of what was going on here. Uh, the criteria for eligibility, uh, as you can see, citizen, male, physically fit, between ages of 18 and 25, unmarried, unemployed, willing to work for $30 a month with $25 going home. And you say, wait a minute, they're only working for $5? Well, of course, all their expenses were paid. And of course, where they came from, <laughs> all they were was a drain on the family. So this was, you know, and plus they ended up in better circumstance. They got clothes every three months if they were worn out legitimately, and of course their meals were taken care of, their room and board, obviously. So it, it basically, you know, freed up, you know, the uh, part of the, the burden on the individual families. Many of the, you know, the, the older men in the family were having to actually leave, you know, to go somewhere else to try to find a job. So getting one off of the family, and, and, or sometimes maybe more than one, was a great help. Uh, and then a volunteer, but willing to remain in camp and work for a minimum of six months is what the deal was. Uh, 
less than 10% of the enrollees were actually uh, high school graduates. So once again, education wasn't at the level that you know it is uh, in this day and age. Uh, here's uh, one of the applications. Uh, the uh, various agencies, there were actually over 25 uh, labor or um, U.S. government agencies involved. 25 government agencies, and you pull this thing off in three months, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Maybe they should find out how they did that and pass that along on some of our programs that they try. Uh, and there were actually nine core areas. Uh, and the War Department, though, was the one that actually provided the management uh, before the workday started. So and that's an important factor that we'll kind of get into. But before we get that far, I'll go into a little story because I like bringing alive the experience. In 1937, 19-year-old Dolphus Park from Avery County, North Carolina, left his home to drive his father to pay taxes. Unbeknownst to him, he was on his way to enroll in the Civil Conservation Corps. Uh, Dolphus father had decided that in order to keep his son out of trouble, he would sign him up for duty in the CCC. One of the other things is, you basically, your family had to be on the relief rolls. And so if that, how they determined where the number of people were coming from was tied into the relief rolls around the country. Uh, and of course their goal was to keep the the enrollees as close to home as possible. The only problem with that is the many of the projects were west of the Mississippi and most of the people were east of the Mississippi. So that created some interesting dynamics. Uh, so, but Dolphus ended up, uh, had a dr uh, job driving a truck um, and his father of course was worried he was around, uh, hanging around with the wrong boys and would end up in trouble. And he ended up uh, being a, uh, a uh, truck driver for the, the rest of his day. So many job skills were uh, acquired by uh, these uh, fellows as they went through this. And here's a picture that we just added uh, of the physical. Uh, you had to pass the physical. Uh, and as you can see, all different uh, sizes. But And here they are doing a little bit of their conditioning, which of course is uh, kind of important. Uh, the physicals were of course mandatory. Uh, and then the conditioning uh, basically before you know they were allowed to uh, uh, be sent off to camp. And here's the expression, which is we can take it. That does not mean they were going to steal. That means we can handle it, you know, in today's vernacular when all said and done. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's an interesting saga. Here's the, uh, the organizational chart. As I say, this was basically army structure uh, commanding officer, junior officers, education leaders, doctor, uh, uh, part-time chaplain. Usually they had at least one uh, uh, religious service a week. And so as I say, uh, before the job started and after the job was done, this is the structure they were under. Gosh, doesn't that sort of fit when World War II starts? We already have people of three million people that have already, you know, got acclimated to this concept of, hey, this is the way, you know, we, we live. So frankly, one of my opinions is, I'm not sure we would have won the Second World War without the CCC either. Because these guys were ready to roll and they were disciplined and uh, had learned a lot and learned how to work together. Which, you know, isn't the simplest thing uh, at times. Here's the uh, typical workday, six uh, uh, hundred, uh, readily shave, shower, and prepare for the day. 6.30, calisthenics, seven o'clock breakfast, 7.30, policing of the barracks and grounds, 7.45, work, sick call, 12 lunch, 1600, return to camp three times, 1700, retreat and dress uniform, 1730, uh, dinner and dress uniform, 1800, free time, recreation or class, um, We'll talk more about the classes. Uh, 2145, in other words, 945, the lights are flashed to warn of lights out. The 2200 lights out. 2250 taps and 2300 uh, uh, bed check. So a very, uh, this is, and we'll talk where these things came from, but this is one of the poems that one of the guys wrote. Uh, the song, the CCC. The CCC is my restoration, I shall not want. But it maketh me arise early in the morning, it giveth me bass with hard water. Oh. 
It restores my appetite. It leads me in the path of work for my bankroll's sake. Yea, though oft do KP duty from morning to night, I will fear no evil, for the infirmary is near me. The oils and pills, they discomfort me. Tables are prepared for me in the presence of my buddies. My plate is heaped up, my stomach all but runneth over. Surely gold bricking and tree nursing shall not follow me all the days of my life, but I shall probably remain in the CCC forever. Yes. And here's the guys heading off. Yes, and as you can see, all different ages, sizes, uh, and that was, yeah, you know, might as well jump into that a little bit. Uh, so, you know, you've got basically the city boys and the country boys. The difference between the two, besides physically where they live, was their background. The city boys tended to be better educated. Country boys were good with how to do things. And so that dynamic was sort of, you know, uh, interesting to put it mildly. And, and then, of course, we have boys from the north, and then we have boys from the south, which, once again, for those that are into the Civil War history, I mean, many of the Civil War people hadn't sort of forgotten about that, so that could be a potential problem when you put 200 men in a camp. So there were a lot of dynamics, and as I say, the city boys tended to be better educated. Many of the country boys, as I say, were very accustomed to hard work. So that, but the city boys, a lot of them were softies, you know, even though they might not have been the best people in the world, they, you know, wanted to do them some stuff that wasn't kosher, but, so all that dynamic of putting 200 guys together sort of gives you a potpourri of all sorts of things. And here they are arriving at the uh, first camp, uh, which is in uh, George Washington National Forest. Uh, it's just west of, uh, of uh, Shenandoah and it's 100 miles from uh, Washington, D.C. And I'll give you a couple of thoughts here on some of the initiation trips that they did. Following uh, Army tradition, new enrollees were called rookies. Each camp had its own routine, but it became CCC tradition for rookies to undergo initiation. They were sent to the woods with a sack and a lantern on a snipe hunt or to the slide, or to the supply room for striped paint, left-handed monkey wrenches, or elbow grease. Uh, the beds were sometimes short-sheeted, uh, or they were told to water the flagpole. So lots of little tricks just to kind of see, you know, if we can. Um, one of the other crazy ones was, go see if you can push that uh, flagpole down. It's a little too high. Uh, please uh, bring it down. Um, and. So there are all sorts of little initiation things. Here's the, uh, the poster uh, there at the uh, first camp. And here's a picture of the, uh, the locally employed uh, men at the start of the workday, uh, you know, uh, basically clearing the men what the job was going to be. So they were either trucked or if it was close by, uh, they were, uh, you know, they, they walked to it. Uh, and the Smokies, they set up a lot of what they call spike camps because of the logistics, and those were temporary camps that would exist for a couple of months, and basically that would just save for the logistics of getting, getting the guys to the uh, uh, campsite. Uh, here's Henry Rich, he's the uh, little fellow here on the, uh, the right, um, and he was fairly typical. He's actually the first enrollee, he ended up actually spending seven years um, and normally if you were just an enrollee two was the max but then if you got promoted into the slim environment then you could you know stay and he actually stayed for uh, seven years and of course was a camp cook um, the, the average enrollee was uh, five foot eight 147 pounds and basically about 18 to 19 uh, and the average had about eight years of schooling so not even high school. Um, but in the first three months, in spite of doing the hardest work they've probably ever done, since they're much better fed, they gained 12 to 15 pounds on average. So, wow. In other words, yeah, that food was really important and it, it changed everything. Uh, and last but not least, it gave them skills, which uh, is, here's uh, some of the, uh, 
uh, tent quarters. Uh, yeah, when they of course started off, they ended up uh, with uh, temporary tents uh, just to, to get things rolling. Uh, I saw uh, some statistics on desertion rates, which uh, is defined as being away from the position for more than eight days. Uh, in 1933, it was eight percent. Uh, and then uh, four years later, it had gone up to 19 to 20 percent, and the reason being jobs were a little more available. Which, by the way, if you got a job and they encouraged you to be developing skills and they actually helped you with interviewing, uh, and as soon as you got a job, then you could leave. Uh, but sometimes, you know, for other reasons, you know, uh, they decided to sort of desert. Here's a uh, shot of uh, Shenandoah National Park, uh, but we have one little uh, cold uh, weather story. My most vivid uh, and wild memory was working on the wood detail, sawing and splitting wood to supply the camp with firewood for heating in all the buildings during Christmas week. Most of the camp was home on the day, uh, home on a five-day Christmas leave. It was 64 degrees below zero. This camp, of course, was up in Minnesota. We worked uh, in 15-minute shifts. We wore uh, mufflers covering our noses and mouths so we wouldn't uh, frost our, long, or our lungs. And uh, they ended up uh, wearing uh, three pairs of socks. So that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. I'm glad I wasn't involved in that one. Here's uh, several of the, uh, this is a, the uh, captain and lieutenant over at Shenandoah National Park at a place called Big Meadows, which is one of their uh, major spots. Here's uh, uh, the uh, camp in uh, actually uh, at Sugar Lands. There are actually two camps there at Sugar Lands, and this uh, old uh, uh, rock uh, formation here was where they had their uh, their uh, plaque, uh, their company number. And they also had a clock there. That's actually on the trail that I maintained, the old Sugarlands Trail. Here's a couple of park superintendents. The one uh, second from the left, he's the one of Grand Canyon. The second from the right is the uh, the one from uh, uh, Ross Eakin, uh from the uh, Great Smokies. Uh, so they were constantly, uh, you know, dealing with politicians because once again, every two years you had to resell this program. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, interaction going on. Uh, here's actually a shot of the, uh, this is the uh, Sugarlands uh, camp uh, setup. Uh, the interesting thing about it though, back to the money part of this, it costs 22000 uh, for camp construction. So that money is going into that local economy. So that helps sell the fact that, hey, we're going to do something good, but oh, by the way, and then it costs 3500 to 5000 monthly for food and supplies. So it was a major financial impact to each location for, you know, in each individual camp. Uh, here's some of the lambs uh, sort of staying around. They were paid by the using service, but they were actually sworn into the CCC. They could be married. And of course, they had the trade and supervisory skills. And as I mentioned, the camp leaders got 45 a month, the assistant got 36 and they kept the money. Uh, and they actually, if they were close, they could actually still live at home if the logistics worked out. And once again, this was so important to get acceptance locally, because these are local guys. These aren't being brought in from California to the Smokies. These, these are Tennessee guys that are getting these jobs. Because, And by the way, many of the camps were set up uh, on old farmlands uh, right next to where the house was or to where the lumber companies had their headquarters. So they made use of, you know, facilities that were already there and, and had already been sort of at least set up for, you know, potential use. So there was a lot of smart stuff that was taking place. And here's a shot that we just added to this. Does he look like he's 17? I don't think so. but. Uh, he, he was uh, the bugler, uh, so they had recordings, there were bugles uh, to kind of get things uh, started in the morning. And here's uh, our after uh, dinner uh, saluting of the flag. Uh, they were provided two sets of clothing, uh, work clothes were blue denim, uh, the uh, dress code was Army 
Army Olive Drab. Gee, isn't that odd that it's Army Olive Drab? Hmm. Yeah, so, but deliberately they downplayed the Army part of it because they didn't want to make it into the, hey, this was a war thing that we got going. But as I say, it really kind of, to put it mildly, worked out well when we ended up with the mess that we ended up with with uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is the lineup for the roll call. Uh, work call senior uh, leaders gave the assignments, and as I mentioned before, they either walk or road uh, to the uh, to the job. Here's the, uh, the typically there were five uh, forty bed uh, dorms, uh, and uh, oh yes, yeah, we do have a little bed check story here. In the CCC, in my camps at least, you slept in open barracks. Uh, everyone had to be in his bed by lights out. In our camp, there was a mandatory bed check each night. What that entailed was the night guard coming to the door of the barracks and looking in the door to see that everyone was in bed under the blankets when we were supposed to be. Now, this particular night guard, who was not one of our officers, was a real son of a gun. He would come when we were asleep and shine the flashlights in your face and be noisy, generally making a pain of himself. Well, one night we decided to get him for fun. Each of us had a shoe, one of our boots handy, and none of us went to sleep. We waited for the night guard, then when he came into the door and shined his stinking flashlight at us, wham, 30 boots came flying at him. He was buried in him. Everyone was laughing for a second. The light was suddenly switched on as a bellow of cursing came from the man in the door who, we realize now, wasn't the night guard we expected. It was one of the army lieutenants. What a grand and glorious feeling that was. Oh yes. Best laid plans of men and mice. This is actually them stuffing their mattresses with straw. I mean, talk about <laughs> how creative. I mean, this. Yeah, uh, they, they had their act together. They knew what was going on. So if the going ever gets tough, you know, think of this. You know. <laughs> and of course, this is the, uh, the, the chow. Uh, critical, critical. Uh, there was actually one uh, camp that I read where there, the actually the army commander was let go because there was inspections by the U.S. Army uh, quarterly at each camp. And there had been a major revolution at this particular camp, and a hundred CCC guys got thrown out. And what they were complaining about was the bad food. So the army decided, okay, we're going to go check, see what happened. Well, lo and behold, the army commander was not exactly using all of the money to get good food. He was getting about the worst possible, but cheap stuff. And so he basically got fired on the spot once they realized. What this character, but right as you can imagine, I mean the major plus of this, besides all the skills and the interactions and helping the environment, and everything else is you know the health of these guys, and so uh, yeah, this was important. So the cook staff was probably the most important staff in the entire organization because that's how you kept morale up. And here's uh, you know uh, the inside of uh, the setup here. Uh, And of course, they uh, had their own little post exchange, which was open from 7:30 to 9 at night. Uh, soda, candy, cigarettes, of course, were worried about in those days. And there was beer, and of course, it was served at the veterans' camps, because of course they're in a whole different set of dynamics age-wise. Uh, here's the other wonderful thing that came out of this program: uh, the educational part. As time went on, they realized. You know, to make sure that these guys had skills. First of all, they got to be able to read and write, and second of all, you know, the job skills. So, if they got uh, any of these classes, if there were ten people interested, they held a class, and they got a certificate after they completed it. But it, you know, it, and most of the guys kind of caught on. Well, yeah, I might as well while I'm doing. You know, I mean, how many games of pool do I want to shoot? You know. Let's go, you know, get some uh, skills here, and of course, then they had the, the job-related skills uh, that uh, you know were taught, you know, from the standpoint of this is the way to do it, not just out there on the job and hey, you better get this thing done, you know, kind of deal. So all sorts of, because I think in my book I listed over 30 different trades that these guys ended up 
mastering based on you know what this wonderful program did but so the program got more sophisticated as time went on a lot of it was due to this Frances Perkins lady that was in charge of the program she really used her head and said we're going to make a difference you know in these these people's lives and here uh, we have a little classroom uh, going on uh, it just you name it and they had a class for it uh, and the guys, as I say, as time went on, uh, really caught on. Uh, church services, as I say, at least once a week. Usually they were uh, visiting uh, ministers and uh, several different uh, ministries were brought in, depending on you know, what area and, and where the guys had, had came from. And here's some uh, reproducing of colonial furniture at uh, Yorktown National Park. because. Uh, those were the yeah any preservation type thing the ccc could get involved in this is uh, always an interesting one uh the safety honor roll on the left side is those people that have done their job and there have been no problems on the right side if you make that list you're embarrassed that's the careless side and you want to avoid that because your buddies are going to sort of needle you and on the right side then they list what you did wrong. So, um, and actually the safety record, for instance, the, uh, a lot of the, not a lot, but one of the major activities that they did to help society was firefighting. When they kept statistics on the CCC firefighters versus the regular firefighters, the CCC were uh, they only had one third the problems that the uh, national statistics were for fighting fire. So they really, you know, were, were taught well, because once again, they were taught by people that, you know, knew what they were doing. And, and these guys were trying to learn to pick up some skills. And of course, there's a little bit of fun to be had here. Got to work on our pool game. And of course they had the football. And, but this is one of my favorites, guys teaching each other how to dance. This is dangerous, this is dangerous. No, that shouldn't be done. There. But once again, one of the things that they would do is they'd have open houses, which we'll show in the next shot here. And that was multifaceted. Sometimes a busload of the young ladies locally were brought in. In addition to the locals that they were trying to clue in that, hey, these aren't a bunch of jerks and these aren't a bunch of troublemakers, these are a bunch of good people. And so, you know, back to that getting locally accepted was really important. So, of course, they told the guy, you better be on your best behavior when well, we got people coming in here or you're in big time trouble. So, it, it was really, and of course, there were many marriages that came out of this when all was said and done but if you look at it the other way how about the local guys that are not part of the ccc they weren't quite as thrilled with this and for instance in shenandoah national park there's a documented case where they would set fires on friday night uh, in that area to make sure that the ccc guys couldn't go to town on a weekend because they were going to be busy fighting the fire so this local acceptance, it's, you know, it's got, it depends who's involved kind of deal. So, <laughs> yeah, the more you read about some of this stuff, it's like, holy oh, cow, right, it's, you know, just what happens with human beings, you know. And, uh, of course, these guys that would do some of those tricks are probably unemployed and very bitter that they didn't get into the program or that they just thought these guys were taking all the local girls. What's going on here? Come on. Uh, this is the national newspaper called Happy Days, uh, which uh, basically uh, was kind of a PR thing, um, and it accentuated the positive. It talked about uh, uh, safety, patriotism. It had various columns uh, on brass hats, and there's a champions column there. But one of the most interesting things they did is they had encouraged each of the camps to have their own uh, camp paper. And what they started doing is they started evaluating the camp papers and they put them on a, uh, a scale of one to five, one being the top and five being the worst. And uh, they also um, uh, offered five dollars for any poem that was printed. In fact, to some of these poems that I end up showing. And a one dollar for inven inventions or suggestions that improved anything in the CCC. 
So it was kind of an interesting little tool, uh, but it, it kind of, and once again, it fit into the selling of the CCC. There were actually 33 uh, presentations uh, put together to promote the Civil Conservation <coughs> Corps that were spread in various media environments to once again keep selling it. Um, so a lot of dynamics that went into this. Uh, here's uh, the, uh, the one over there in the Cherokee, uh, North Carolina. 80% uh, of the camps had their own paper. Arizona had one called the Depression Cure. There was one in the Phantom Ranch called the Ace in the Hole. Kansas had uh, one called the AWOL, which is all's well on the limestone. Uh, Washington had one called one or up and atom. <coughs> California, this is a, a crazy one, had one called the tabloid owl. And its motto was, it's a paper for people who think they think. Okay. Everybody, raise up. All right, that's us. Here. Right. Work projects. Ah, yes. This actually is over in Shenandoah, the Skyline Drive. You know, that's uh, got 105 miles. And actually, that was the uh, concept that the park superintendent here in the Smokies was talking about doing here, was actually doing the road right across the crest, just like they did in Shenandoah. That's a 105-mile road over there, and it's got 75 overlooks. Ross Eakin was voted down. He was not allowed to do that. And of course, Shenandoah is actually topographically lower than the Smokies. Could you imagine the winter time all across the crest, how often that would be open? Probably not very much uh, with you know, the, the approach that's used. Uh, but uh, of course, they opened up you know, these isolated areas. Of course, the Smokies and Shenandoah are hooked up by the Blue Ridge Parkway, and it goes for 469 miles, starting from Cherokee and goes you know, all the way up to the, uh, the south end of uh, Shenandoah. Here's uh, one of the major things that uh, they uh, created, uh, the fire towers, really important, of course. Uh, and as I say, they were not a believer in fires, but they, they had uh, the uh, guys uh, that were uh, stationed out there, but they had to, to build them. The one on the left is actually um, Mount Cameron, which is uh, probably my favorite spot in the park. It's got the best view because it's where it sits. You always get wind, so you get the best view. Once you get up there, it's not an easy hike, but if you ever get a chance, check it out. Uh, it's, uh, and it, as you can tell, it's got a walkway around it. Really cool, cool spot up there. Uh, and then the other one is the Clayman's Dome, which now they've got, you know, the, the, uh, the sea mount deal that kind of circles around, but uh, there was a fire tower. And once again, they had two fire towers could see the same spot is the way they figured out how they put in the fire towers so that they could you know, make sure they had a real fire or what was going on kind of deal. The uh, trail work on the retaining walls, yeah, without retaining walls on some of this terrain, I mean, these things are just going to disintegrate, uh, you know, with the amount of moisture, unlike what's happened this year, uh, that normally happens. And of course, here's uh, the uh, chestnut blight. This actually is a, uh, or, uh, over there in uh, Shenandoah, uh, and that, that's the problem with the diseases. Once those kind of things happen, now what are you going to do? Uh, and this was right in their open area called Big Meadows over there in Shenandoah. This is uh, FDR uh, dedicating uh, <coughs> over there at uh, uh, Shenandoah. The fellow that was in charge of the program uh, was a guy by the name of Robert Fetchner. And uh, FDR, one of his problems was uh, they, uh, the unions weren't real happy with this concept, saying, wait a minute, you know, is this going to take away union jobs? And so he put the uh, uh, guy in charge of the International Association of Machinists in charge of the program to sell the fact that, no, this isn't going to hurt the unions. Uh, and there was some criticism that they were only going to allow Democrat CCC enrollee. No, they didn't do that at all, because he knew they ain't going to play. <laughs> or, you know, they're not going to except this program. Yeah, this is some of the tree uh, transplanting, which, you know, as you can tell, man, major activities, another one. Yeah, yeah, you would be on the right side of that. Uh, 
King George uh, VI and Queen Elizabeth visited one of the uh, uh, camps in uh, 1939. This is a, a little round top at uh, Gettysburg because uh, there had been uh, some major uh, weather problems and they basically had to, uh, to redo that whole area. That was you know, one of the most important uh, sites during the uh, uh, Civil War. This is uh, uh, over there at uh, uh, Gettysburg. Uh, this particular group, they ended up uh, resetting uh, thousands of grave headstones. And this is an African-American group, so it was accepted in that area. This particular firefighting group was an African-American group too. And basically they, uh, one of the ways that they had of communication, they fought the 1935 Malibu fire and they were the first company using uh, homing pigeons from the front lines uh, back to the base camp to get the word of you know how things are going or not going out here. And here's, uh, as I say, some of the uh, the work, and as I say, their safety worker was really impressive. Here's some of the Native Americans. The Native Americans probably, when this problem uh, or when this program stopped, were probably the ones that got hit the most because they didn't have any fallback programs. Here they're, they're doing what they call rip wrapping to, uh, uh, to set up a canal so that you know the water is going to flow where they want it to go. Short and long-term benefits: uh, all states and nearby communities uh, receive benefits financially and quality of life. Forty thousand CCC illiterates were taught to read. Each enrollee improved financially, physically, mentally, and in marketable job skills. Families of enrollees received a significant income, a total of $663 million in the Depression, big time. Uh, established conservation awareness and advocates and a model for conservation programs. Yeah, so these, these guys, right, they experienced parks. Yeah, they experienced parks. Uh, significant public visitation. Uh, yeah, there were only 13 states that had a decent number of state parks before the CCC came. There are 830 after CCC. 90% uh, of the CCC enrollees served the country in World War II. Uh, and of course, very simply, uh, we'll go through these kind of quick. Uh, collected 13 uh, million uh, tree seeds, uh, 6 million man days operating. Oh, here's the big one. 3 billion trees planted. Three billion trees, four million man days in firefighting, uh, sixty-eight uh, thousand miles of fire break. Oh, uh, oh, forty million acres of farmlands received erosion control. Nine hundred and seventy-two million fish stocked in seventy-six hundred diversion dams. One point two million man days of emergency work on the floods in the Ohio and Mississippi valleys. Uh, Great Smokies Park, <coughs> Shenandoah, 360 Civil War battlefields, 4,000 historic structures, 38,500 bridges, uh, 89,000 miles of telephone lines. And here's uh, uh, the Cumberland Mountain State Park, which is of course in Tennessee, uh, which is actually the largest uh, bridge. I misspoke a little bit. Uh, the second largest is the Elkmont. This was done by Salvia, uh, Alvin York, who's the Medal of Honor recipient. Great story. It's covered in more detail in the book. This is FDR uh, dedicating the park at uh, the Smokies in 1940. This is uh, Glacier National Park. Uh, uh, they're having lunch, as you can probably tell. This is the bottom of the Grand Canyon, where that ace in the hole paper was. This is the swimming pool that no longer exists at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Now it's kind of a camping area. And this is, uh, they're putting in uh, the trail that connects two of the trails. It's a two million, yeah, they had to blast a thousand feet above <laughs> the floor, a two mile trail. And nobody, and they put in the phone lines out there. And that's the retaining wall of the south rim. This is one of the uh, CCC guys being taken out that had appendicitis at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. This is uh, some work out there in Sequoia, cutting down a dead tree. This is in Zion, one of our 
uh, really exciting parks. You usually don't see that much snow in Zion. This is the, the road, one of the roads that heads into Zion they worked on. This is the cables in uh, Yosemite up to Half Dome. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa. And this is uh, some work going on in Mammoth uh, Bay. This is Shenandoah. That's a rock water fountain. And this is uh, the one that uh, out in Mount Rainier National Park, and we just added this picture. But more importantly, we added this picture. And this might be a good way to wrap things up. This is an ice cave that the guys were able to visit. This is an ice cave in uh, Mount Rainier National Park that the guys were able to visit uh, that existed uh, up until 1970. And of course, global warming has now changed a lot of stuff, and the ice cave there no longer exists. But this was one of their off duty things that they would do. Wow, wouldn't that be a cool thing to, to jump off into? And a little bit of boxing here, uh, baseball, of course. And of course, they uh, got to have the, the music and the bonding that happened with these guys was incredible. Uh, the friendships, uh, you know, 50 years after the fact, uh, there's about 80 different interviews in the book that basically, uh, when reunions were held, they uh, uh, ended up uh, transcribing them. And I went through and picked out some, you know, really interesting stories. And it's, it just kind of blows your mind. But on that note, let's end up with the final little poem uh, that one of the guys uh, wrote. We build a million bridges and walk through miles of mud. We've cleaned a million mess kits and peeled a million spuds. We've shoveled tons of gravel, a million rocks we've loved. But there'll be no rocks in heaven, for we've loved our rocks in hell. We've killed a million ants and bugs that sneaked in for our eats. We've shook a million bed bugs from our dirty sheets. And the number of nights we've frozen as low the mercury fell, but will not freeze in heaven because we've done our hitch in hell. We've heard a million whistles blow from morning to late at night. How we like to kill the dirty bums that robbed us of our rights. And the foreman that we've had over us, how many we can't tell, but we'll bar them all from heaven till they do their hitch in hell. When that final call is sounded and we've laid aside life's cares, we'll do our final big parade right up those golden stairs. The angels, they will welcome us, their harps will start to play. Then we'll draw a million canteen checks and spend them in a day. It is then we will hear St. Peter greet us loudly with his yell. Take those front seats, CCC boys, for you've done your hitch in hell. <laughs> That's our presentation for today. Yes. How many camps are in, we're in this room? We're 22. 22? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And actually, after the um, program stopped, of course, we have World War II. Of course, there was another group of people called conscientious objectors. And some of the camps ended up, including the Smokies at Sugar Lands, as an example, and a couple down on the southern side, uh, ended up being for conscientious objectors. But the conscientious objectors found out quickly, you better not go to the local towns, because if they know you're a CO, this is not going to play well. And it, it, they had a bad scene in Gatlinburg where you know all of them got kind of beat up when they went to town, and that's the last time they went to town. Because you know, they had religious beliefs. That they, but they ended up doing the same kind of work. Uh, and it was uh, churches that actually paid for the, uh, uh, the camps. Uh, and they were given a nominal amount and of course didn't have to serve but we're doing this instead so yeah so that happened around the country yes these are obviously young men doing all this work but the work that we see in the, the smokies is an amazing engineering oh absolutely who, who designed all those bridges and things and got supervised them to build such good things well yeah, once again, it was the power structure of the CCC, and then, of course, the implementation was the, why these locally employed men had to really be skilled, and that's also covered somewhat in the book. There are several major companies that came out of this activity based on the skill 
uh, that you know was acquired in you know building roads and, and, and massive structures. So there were a lot of things that you know sort of interplayed with this whole program. That and that's why I say it wasn't just which is a lot. I mean, and what it did for the whole park system, what it did for the farms, and what it did for the catastrophes. But what one of the did biggest it, outcomes of that is Blaylock construction. Yep. Yeah. Given the input that the CCC had on the, on the park systems, there doesn't seem to be a, a lot of recognition of the CCC program in the park. I, you, all, you usually just have to go because there has been no park that I've been to that I can't find, but you've got to ask. Uh, so in other words, people aren't talking about it. It's more, you know, people that are writing books and, and what have you that are kind of keeping it alive or people that had relatives that had this experience and they know, as I say, 50 years after they served, they came back for a reunion. From something that they did when they were 17 or 18 or 19. I mean, come on, this really had to have impacted them to be, you know, it's not just an easy, you know, reunion. It's like, wow, well, this was a big deal in my life. Yeah. So we're, we're losing <laughs> that connection. Right. Um, as those people right. have died and moved on, you know. Right. Well, that's the thing. And that's why I think the more this story gets shared, the better off we are because I'm that's why I believe in history because if you don't pay attention to it guess what <laughs> yeah you're going to repeat has some problems you know and uh, and the CCC as I say there, there have been some other programs some states have this kind of program that both men and women are are allowed to, to participate in that you know take care of parts and what have you so you know there's there is a continuing but if you ask somebody in each park, I'll guarantee you there is something that the CCC did. Because I'd say I've hiked in 51 of the 63 and every one of them had something. And it varies, but uh, yeah, it was, it was an important thing because without it, you know, uh, you know, now, now it, it's frankly, you know, like in the case of the Smokies, I mean, there's 2,300 of us that volunteer there. A couple of years ago, there were 3,000. Unfortunately, we're all getting older, but if younger people don't step into these roles, uh, these parks, because, you know, there's only 350 full-time rangers in this park here, uh, and there's, you know, seven times the number of volunteers, so, you know, we we got to get the word out that, you know, whether it's you're volunteering for your park or your church, but <laughs> you can really make a difference, and, it, you know, it's a win-win, I call it, kind of deal, so. Any other uh, thoughts or, yes? Who had the idea that they had to send twenty-five dollars a month back to the family? I just think that was brilliant. Oh, that was Frances no, Perkins. A, a woman. A yeah. Woman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She she had the big picture. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes the family things have changed, and sometimes they just saved the money and then gave it to their son, you know, later on. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, as I say, I mean, God only knows what would have happened to those families without it. I mean. Plus, as I say, they got one less person to feed, and this guy's going to be in better shape than they are, you know, based on his, you know, new skills, plus, you know, the way he's being treated. Uh, so that's why I call it, that's the best government program <laughs> that impacted, you know, in every direction. Yeah. There may be some people here who have relatives who work. Oh, yes. Yeah. My grandfather okay. did. I had four uncles. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah, you know what we're talking about. I mean, that's... It was life altering. One of that month three at Cosby, so they were okay. spread out. Oh yeah. yeah. It, uh, and, and and once again they acquired a love for nature too. And above all the city boys that didn't have it, you know. <laughs> so it created, you know, an environmental start, you know, and things that got more sophisticated, but right. And as I say, you same deal with the state park, go to any state park and talk to somebody that's been around for a while and they'll, they'll tell you what the CCC did because yeah and you'll see rock structures all over the place that, oh yeah that was yeah, yeah. all right well okay. thank you Bill I appreciate it <laughs> you might mention the book is available again oh yes yeah the book is available and uh, yeah it's uh, 
It's a labor of love, but I think, as I said, what makes it unique is not only does it explain the program and make the case for why it's America's second best idea, but it shares these individual stories that, you know, I find very intriguing. Uh, yeah, it's, it took a four and a half years, but it was well worth it. Uh, we'd like for now for you to stay around and uh, join us in our little uh, treat. Okay. A lot of good food. Do any of you have any stories of the people that uh, worked with the CCCs? My grandfather did. It was in southern Indiana. He worked at, uh, at Lincoln Nas uh, State Park. And also I think that he was involved in one of the navigation dams on the Ohio River back in the late 1920s. Your family worked in the CCC? Uh, my grandpa. Your grandpa, what was his name? Uh, Elliot Ramsey. I would like for you to sign my please. And when did he work? Where? Cosby. Yes. Are you work with uh, Mount Camera Tower? Yes. 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 Yes.